On the morning of July 4th, 2025, one of the deadliest flash floods in modern history struck Texas. Thunderstorms dumped 10 to 15 inches of rain in barely six hours time. Residents and campers woke up to cell phones blaring. Thousands scurried to higher ground. But by then, it was too late. More than 100 people drowned, including at least 95 in Kerr County, Texas. As of the filming of this piece, dozens were still missing. It's the deadliest thunderstorm-driven flash flood in the United States since 1976, when Big Thompson Canyon in Colorado flooded, killing 144 people. Something very clearly went wrong in Texas. Let's look back at what happened. On June 28th, weather models became bullish at the idea of a tropical storm forming and hitting Mexico. On June 29th, Barry formed, but it didn't have long over the Gulf, meaning it had a very brief time to intensify and only hit Tamaulipas, Mexico as a low-end tropical storm. Instead, all it really did was cook up some showers and thunderstorms over the open Gulf, and eventually it moved ashore in Tamaulipas on June 30th. But all that moisture in the atmosphere wafted north into Texas, leading to an incredibly moisture-rich air mass as we approached the 4th of July weekend. Now, look at the path that Barry took, and look at where the air over Texas was coming from. All of Barry's leftover moisture wafted north into Texas. Now, on July 3rd, the National Weather Service Weather Prediction Center issued this outlook for the next day. You can see in the green, a level one out of four marginal risk for flash flooding and excessive rainfall, but really, we weren't expecting much in the way of widespread flooding. They later upgraded to a level two out of four slight risk. Now, we knew the atmosphere had copious amounts of moisture, but we didn't really see a big trigger. That's because there were no large scale triggers. We didn't see any cold fronts. There were no warm fronts nearby. There were no high or low pressure systems. It was just kind of a soggy air mass and no real weather systems nearby. Nonetheless, given the saturated air mass, the National Weather Service opted to issue a flood watch. It came out at 1.18 p.m. Central Time on Thursday, July 3rd. The National Weather Service in Austin, San Antonio, basically saying a lot of folks seeing one to three inches, localized totals up to five to seven inches. They kept the forecast the same that night. Even at 1.30 in the morning on Friday morning, as the flooding was getting going, they still said one to three inches with localized five to seven inch totals. But at that same time, something else was happening. NOAA's Weather Prediction Center in College Park, Maryland pushed out this statement, essentially warning of some higher end flooding coming. They wrote, quote, hourly rainfall in excess of two to three inches seems reasonable given the environment and localized six hour totals over six inches will be possible some flash flood impacts could be significant. If we look at surface winds at the time, we note this little weak low level swirl. This was something called a mesoscale convective vortex, basically a broad weak swirl that in this case was tied to Barry's leftover mid-level circulation. This swirl helped to focus thunderstorms. It also helped to ingest moisture. And because this thing wasn't moving, the storms weren't moving either. If we take a look at radar early in the morning of July 4th, we can see storms basically twisting around each other. And that's the key time when it really became apparent something was very wrong. Now, I spoke with Troy Kimmel, who's a good friend of mine, a longtime Austin meteorologist. He saw that swirling motion too. We saw some of those spins that were down the micro to mesoscale that were so that were so small that covered the northwest part of Travis County, where I watched intense torrential rains actually rotating around one another, storms doing this in a 15 to 20 mile wide area. And you know, it was those things and figuring out where that little spin had gone the next day is trying to figure out what was going on in the forecast. At 1.14 in the morning on Friday, July 4th, the National Weather Service issued a flash flood warning. It included Kerr County, and this meant near and just west of Kerrville. It also included Camp Mystic. Now, I want to point out this little considerable tag at the bottom of the warning. This is a step above a normal flash flood warning. We have three flavors of flash flood warnings when they're issued. You have the base, you have the then increasingly urgent, uh, more of the considerable, what we call considerable tag. And then you've got the catastrophic tag and that would then also lean over into what we call a flash flood emergency. It's the most urgent. Cell phones in the warning polygon would have squealed with a wireless emergency alert if there was cell service, but that's far from reliable in Texas Hill Country. But a NOAA weather radio doesn't require cell service. It has battery backup. You don't need internet. And every camp or school in America should have one. This would have been a lifeline. By three in the morning, thunderstorms were blossoming over Texas Hill Country, and they were producing rainfall rates of three plus inches per hour, and they weren't moving. 
At 3.19 in the morning, the National Weather Service updated their warning, writing, move to higher ground now, act quickly to protect your life. At 4.03 a.m., the National Weather Service upgraded to a dire flash flood emergency. This again made everybody's phones squeal in the area, including Camp Mystic, and the Weather Service specifically called out Hunt, where Camp Mystic is located. Move to higher ground now, they wrote. This is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. Do not attempt to travel unless you are fleeing an area subject to flooding or under an evacuation order. Now let's look at the flood data. Here's the river gauge upstream on the Guadalupe River. At two in the morning, water levels were only 1.96 feet. That's pretty normal. The flash flood emergency comes out at four in the morning when the water levels are up to about 12.4 feet. The nearest flood gauge to Camp Mystic is a few miles downstream. That means it's likely water levels probably rose a few minutes earlier or perhaps even tens of minutes earlier at Camp Mystic compared to this flood gauge. 7.6 feet is like the baseline water level. At three in the morning, we were at about 10.1 feet, so pretty typical, 2.5 feet above where we should have been. So we only had two and a half feet of water level rise at that point. But water levels reached an all time record of 37.52 feet at 5.10 in the morning. That's an hour into the flash flood emergency and roughly four hours into the flash flood warning. So they had four hours notice. Now let's do something uncomfortable. Let's overlay the timing of the alerts with where the water levels were at various times. Here's a timeline and here's what the water levels did. If the people in Hunt heeded the first flash flood warning that made their cell phones go off, they would have had one hour and 54 minutes notice before the water even began rising and roughly four hours notice before it reached its historic crest. Again, in Camp Mystic, it's likely the water levels rose a few minutes earlier. But still, keep in mind, this means they had 60 to 90 minutes between the issuance of the flash flood warning and when water levels reached minor flood stage. 60 to 90 minutes could have been used for action. Now here's a layout of Camp Mystic. Okay, you have the, the South Fork of the Guadalupe River. You have Cypress Creek, which kind of branches off and goes through the camp. Most of the upperclassmen housing for the seniors was about 600 feet away from the river. The underclassmen were closer to about like 200, 250 feet away from the South Fork of the Guadalupe River. Most of the fatalities occurred in the junior level housing. Now I'd like to look at a topographic map to plot these features again and show you the height of the terrain and where the hills are and where the valleys are. Once again, I've labeled the student housing. Now let's do something very uncomfortable. At this point, I've drawn basically where the water would have gone. And this is in an ultra high end extreme scenario. Anything in blue likely would have been inundated or close to the water. But this point here is more than 100 feet above where the water would have gotten to. Camp Mystic does have higher terrain. It's hill country. There are hills and there are valleys. If they got up to a hill, they would have survived. The official investigation will take months or perhaps longer, but let me be perfectly clear. If administrators had implemented flash flood evacuations when the warning came out, 60 to 90 minutes would have been more than sufficient time to evacuate, and the results likely would have been very different. Three hours is roughly what a lot of folks have between the time the wireless emergency alert came out and the time the wall of water essentially arrived. Is three hours enough to evacuate? Is three hours enough to, if you're sleeping in a cab in the middle of the night, get to someplace safe? Uh, I honestly think it is, and a lot of people say it's not, but if let's pretend this wasn't a wall of water. Let's pretend it's a tornado and we issue a tornado emergency and we say like way downstream, okay, this is a tornado coming. We see people get out of the path of tornadoes with under 15 minutes. We've seen this happen in areas like Mayfield. We saw it happen this year in London, Kentucky. We heard stories of people getting out in time. It's just, I think people don't take the alert seriously because they're like, oh, it's just like a flash flood. I don't actually need to sort of pay attention to this alert and I don't need to take the action. I think a lot of times, a lot of emergency managers like to sort of cry wolf. And unfortunately, this is one of the things where so many false negatives do lead to a very low response to when we actually have a warning for a literal thing that's going on that people need to pay attention to. But you know what? It didn't take but a few hours to bring five to 600 first responders in to search for bodies. I want to see the emergency action plans for these communities and for these camps. If they don't have them, and I know the cities do and the counties do, they have to by law. But these camps, if they don't have an emergency action plan, Matthew, they're negligent. Now, Riley Dibble says that portions of the Guadalupe River see flooding like this every 10 to 20 years. Camp Mystic, in particular, just happened to be lucky for a number of decades. It came out right around that 13 to 15 year flood, but it's actually 
in reality probably a little less um, of the recurring the recurrence interval is a little bit less than that but it still happens frequently and a one in 1000 year rainfall event is not needed to trigger a flood like this we even so if you're saying this type of flooding can happen in every 13 14 15 years why is it we don't remember that is it a flaw in the way human behavior is? Is it that we're building our infrastructure wrong? Or is it that different parts of the river are flooding and this time we got unlucky? How can something like this still happen in the year 2025 if it has happened before? Have we learned nothing? Well, I think the main issue, especially with flooding, is it's a very broad term. So obviously this was a flash flood. It was a giant 30 foot wall of water making its way down. But we also say flood is like, okay, there's three inches of standing water after it's been raining for a month. As of right now, we don't really have a way to communicate the difference between that. Riley explained that resources are available and you can actually customize alerts from various flood sensors to go directly to your phone. Personalized alerting. What people don't even know is a thing is you can actually go to like the stream gauge, the USGS stream gauge website, and there's something called water alerts. Say you figure out the closest stream gauge to you, this is where you live. You can actually go upstream like three or four stream gauges. So that's about 45 minutes upstream. Select that gauge and you can create personalized alerts. So you can say, okay, hey, when this stream gauge reaches five feet above what's normal, I want it to send me an alert downstream. At the same time, this is something that the National Weather Service or any other local official should be paying attention to, and they need to sort of do a better job of getting these alerts out. Now, the day after Camp Mystic flooded, another 10 to 15 inches of rain came elsewhere along the river, causing significant flooding, more fatalities, and the town of Burnett, Texas, saw 8.6 inches in three hours' time. And once again, if we take a look at radar, you can see those rain showers kind of dancing around each other, once again tied to another mesoscale convective vortex. I've been in the last couple of days through shock. I've been through sadness. I've been mad. Uh, and now I just sort of want answers about what went right, what went wrong. I think it'll take an independent investigation to do that. I'm, I'm, uh, our colleague, uh, Mike Smith, has recommended that we have a National Disaster Review Board. I'm fully on board with that. Major flooding like this can and will happen again in Texas Hill Country. Hopefully next time when it does happen, we'll see different results and there will have been lessons learned. Follow My Radar on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, and Windows.